Well, welcome back to Materials Engineering. And today we're going to introduce um, uh, another one of those fundamental processes that ties a lot of things together and it's going to recur over and over again in the course as we try to understand uh, processes that are occurring in, uh, in materials. And the one way to begin thinking about this is to consider uh, Oreo cookies, that most perfect of factory-made cookies. And you think about the packaging that they come in, um, and that packaging has several layers in it, actually, and one of those layers is aluminum. And so I'd like you to pause the recording for a moment and think, see if you can think of at least three reasons that we might use aluminum as a layer in the packaging for Oreo cookies. Now, hopefully you have a list. Um, and there are really three drivers for using the aluminum. Uh, the first of those is that uh, we need a barrier material, something to keep uh, oxygen and moisture, uh, H2O, out of the uh, packaging. Oxygen is really bad because it, it uh, reacts with the molecules that give most food its flavor. And they also react with vitamins and minerals. Of course, there's none of those in Oreo. But, uh, but flavor is, is supremely important. Um, and water molecules also um, can penetrate many kinds of packaging, and they make the cookie soggy. And you think about that. Um, how does air get in if we took a plastic bag and put it over your head? Uh, you'd be dead very quickly. And, and so any oxygen that is penetrating through a package is obviously happening. It's penetrating at a very low level or very slow speed. Uh, the problem you have is that an Oreo is going to sit in that package for a long time, and it doesn't take a lot of oxygen to ruin uh, the flavor. So we have very low tolerance for oxygen presence, and, um, and we have a long time that, that that oxygen can diffuse. So even though diffusion is going on all the time, or the process of oxygen penetrating through the material is going on all the time with plastic, um, it's particularly a problem in long-term um, storage situations. The aluminum provides two other uh, virtues. It's a barrier to light, and ultraviolet light in particular is very bad for organic molecules that um, have flavor, and so light will change the flavor as well of the food. And it's reasonably strong material that's inexpensive, and so there's other metals that can be plated or applied to plastic substrates, nickel, copper, gold, um, silver, all of those apply very easily. However, they're all quite a bit more expensive than aluminum, so it's the inexpensive, um, non-reactive, non-food uh, food flavoring uh, metallic coating that can be applied. All right, so what is this process? How is it that molecules penetrate through a solid so that oxygen can come from the outside atmosphere and ruin your Oreos? Well, it's really a very simple mechanism. Oxygen molecules are very small compared to the large polymer molecules or whatever you have in the, in the material. And it's possible then for these small atoms or small molecules to penetrate by jumping from vacancy or from uh, lattice gap, these empty spaces in the lattice, to lattice point. Remember, unless we're at absolute zero, this picture isn't accurate because these atoms are fluctuating or oscillating. They're, they're not stationary, and the hotter we get, the more they're fluctuating around the equilibrium points. So at any instant, there are gaps all over the place through which other atoms can jump. And so this is the problem. And now in polymers, we have huge gaps between the molecules. So polymers, in general, are very bad barrier materials. They don't slow diffusion down particularly well. And we'll look at that. This is called interstitial diffusion. That is, the atoms or molecules are jumping from empty site to empty site. Now, a couple of things about diffusion is the first thing to recognize is that it's a random process. It is caused by the random motions of particles or molecules. And so we see, we think we see oxygen very systematically flowing through the wall. That's not what's happening. What's happening is we're having a random transfer of molecules through the wall, but to start with, there was no oxygen on the inside. So there might be, you often will pack in nitrogen. So it's maybe nitrogen molecules are randomly trading with oxygen molecules in the exterior. So if we started with a solid here that really had nothing in it, one or two of these little molecules, um, and we, we do a time step, and we let all the nearby molecules jump, 
And what we find is that if they jump randomly, and these are all just kind of randomly applied errors, arrows, some that are on the surface jump away. Okay, some jump in. Why do two jump in? And there were there's we had one inside and it leaves. Well, there were only two inside to begin with. And so, and this was near the surface, it happens to leave. Because there were many more on the surface, we end up with two flowing in, one leaving, and there's a net flow of one. Now, there's no intelligence or driving force here. This is random. The key is that there's a higher concentration outside than in, and so in any exchange or random process, there'll be a net flow until the concentration inside is the same as the concentration outside, at which point atoms will leave at the same rate they enter. Okay, so, so diffusion requires that there be a difference in concentration. Um, it's going to be going on all the time. You just won't see any change if there is not a concentration difference. So what about big atoms? What about atoms that are not interstitial? So we begin with a classic uh, metal couple, copper and nickel. We take two pieces, we press them together over here on the left side. So if we had a, a super-duper microscope, we had Superman vision, we could see that these arrays of atoms, nickel atoms and copper atoms, are, are lined up like this. And if we plotted concentration, we'd have 100% copper going to zero and 100% nickel going to zero in the copper. Now, here's the key. If we take this couple, and any two metals will do this, the more compatible, the better, and you cook them, nickel atoms will diffuse into the copper, copper atoms will diffuse into the nickel, and after some time period, we will see interpenetration of the atoms on the right here, and you'll see that the concentration has a sigmoidal shape. We have 100% still, and we get far away, from, away enough from the boundary, but nickel concentration drops off, and we begin to see some copper penetrating into the previous nickel area, and nickel penetrating into the copper. And the question is, how does this happen? So if you just step back and do a thought experiment, there are three possible mechanisms by which atoms that are substitutes for each other can trade places. The first of these is called the Zener ring mechanism. And so the atom of interest is in a group that moves cooperatively. Everybody moves, and it appears then that this, this atom has shifted. Because it's different, we would notice a flow. It's also possible for two atoms to switch places. These, these don't, none of these defy the laws of physics. So these are all theoretically possible. And then the last thing that could happen is, well, we could have a vacancy in the host material, and an atom moves into a vacancy. So the question is, all of these mechanisms probably occur, but one of them is probably responsible for most diffusion. And so can we do an experiment to tell us which one is mostly responsible for what's happening? And the experiment that really shows this is called the Kuykendall experiment. Basically, they take two metals, doesn't matter which, as long as they have differential diffusion rates, which we'll talk about in a minute, put tungsten wires at the boundary between them, and the wires are tungsten because tungsten has a tremendously high melting temperature and will probably not um, experience much interdiffusion with the other metals. It's going to become just going to sit there. And then the question will be, well, A atoms are going to diffuse into B, and B atoms are going to diffuse into A, and we're going to watch what happens to the wires as this couple is cooked. And what happens is we notice we started out, the wires on the interface, after cooking this for a while, the wires have moved. They're no longer on the interface. They've moved through solid metal. Now, that's pretty wild. Think about that. So how is that possible? Well, obviously, that means more atoms have gone from A into B than have gone from B back into A. We had a net flow of atoms from right to left, which has pushed the wires to the right. Now, if you think about those three mechanisms, and we'll go back and look at them here, which of those mechanisms will produce a net flow of atoms? Obviously, this one, one goes up, one comes back. Direct switch, one goes left, the other goes right. Only in vacancy drift can we have a net flow because it's possible for one element to have more vacancies than the other. So vacancy drift is the dominant mechanism of um, diffusion in substitutional diffusion. Now, because diffusion is primarily due to atoms moving into vacancies, would it be logical for elements to have the same diffusivity in one another? That is, will the ease of copper diffusing into nickel be the same as the ease of nickel diffusing into copper? Are they going to be different? If you just think back to the solubility rules, they don't have to be the same size. 
So if one of them is a little smaller, it's obvious it's going to diffuse more easily into the other than the large atoms diffusing into a small host. Also, because they don't have the same melting temperatures, um, probably don't have the same energy barrier for vacancy formation, at a given temperature, they're going to have different numbers of vacancies. And he who has more vacancies gets more diffusion. So we don't expect diffusion um, to be the same for two materials. And, and what that creates is if I have two metals coupled, and they don't have the same diffusion rates, I'm going to get imbalanced flow. And so one side's going to get more atoms than it sends the other way. And that produces an interesting result. Copper diffuses into nickel much more easily than nickel into copper. And so copper atoms will overfill the nickel side. They'll keep flowing. Nickel will not replace the copper atoms. And so we actually will begin over time to develop pores or empty spaces along a boundary. This side will be overfilled, which means it wants to expand. But they're bonded together here. The diffusion is filled in any gaps, and they're a single piece. So this side that wants to expand, this side wants to contract because it's missing atoms. And so you're going to end up with this side being stretched. The pore side is having a tensile um, force on it. And the overpack side is going to be under compression. You actually cause internal forces to be generated because of the differential flow. Now, we're going to talk about diffusion bonding in the class, in our class time. Um, but this is one of the consequences of over-diffusing if you're doing a diffusion bond. And uh, joining, joining solids without melting them is a really cool trick. But you have to be careful that you don't overdo it for that very reason. All right. So those are our two mechanisms of diffusion. We have vacancy diffusion, where an atom moves into an empty spot. And then we have interstitial, where atoms move um, into the gaps between the host material atoms or molecules. Now the question is, how easy is this process? And is there a measure for that process? And um, so we have other conditions, obviously, that make that process easier. If you have a grain boundary, for example, these atoms along the grain boundary, if this is our grain boundary, have higher energy. Because they have higher energy, they are more likely to make a jump. Also, because of the higher energy, vacancy formation is easier here because everybody's already at an elevated energy. So we're going to have more energetic atoms. We're going to have easier vacancies. Oh, and the neighbors here are kind of missing, so they don't restrict the atom from diffusing. Also, if we're talking interstitial, this is like a superhighway for very small atoms, and they'll get on a grain boundary, and they'll just take off. They can run great distances very rapidly. So grain boundaries are going to accelerate diffusion. Surfaces have the same kind of effect. If we're, if we're looking at a surface here, this atom is missing his neighbors. Um, obviously, there's no restriction from that side. Higher energy, which means more jumps. And so surface diffusion will often be uh, as much as an order of magnitude greater than diffusion through the solid. And um, in most cases, we can almost treat surface diffusion as instantaneous. Um, it's going to be very, very rapid compared to the bulk behavior. All right. So how do we measure this? Uh, just one other challenge question here. Can you demonstrate self-diffusion? If vacancies are the requirement for diffusion, if um, vacancies are created at any temperature above absolute zero, then a pure element sitting there with vacancies should be a swirling mass of activity. Atoms should be jumping into vacancies. And, and so you should look like the vacancies are moving if you could see them. And so if that's the case, we should be able to. It would be nice if we could do an experiment that would demonstrate self-diffusion occurs. So the challenge for you is can you make a paintbrush small enough to put dots on a bunch of atoms on one side of a solid and then cook this solid and see those atoms move through the solid? Now, if you remember your stuff from chemistry, all iron atoms are not the same. All tungsten atoms are not the same. You have isotopes. And isotopes are identical chemically, but they have different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. So they will behave chemically identically to the um, other vari variations of that element. But if we use one that's radioactive, we can track it. We can track those radioactive atoms. And so in fact, this experiment has been done. We put radioactive isotopes on one side. They cook it. Guess what? The radiation spreads throughout the part by diffusion. Okay. So the question, the next question then, is we have to be able to do some calculations with this stuff to predict behavior. And so um, the first calculation you're going to be introduced to is going to be using that Arrhenius expression we've already seen for vacancies. 
not a surprise. Um, this is for the quantity we call diffusivity, which is simply the ease of diffusion of one species in another. The higher the diffusivity, the more rapidly a species will diffuse into something else. And if you look at the structure, this is the Arrhenius. So this is the energy barrier to diffusion. You may think of it as the energy required to jump into a vacancy. Rather than K, we use the ideal gas constant. And the reason for this is that um, the diffusion models we're going to use assume fairly low concentrations, so a diffusing atom doesn't see any other diffusing atoms. If they do, um, this breaks down, and the R value isn't going to, uh, we're not going to use R here. And then T, again, better be absolute or Kelvin scale. So you're going to need to be able to calculate diffusivity, and you should practice that before you come to class. That might be a quiz question. We'll do one of those in a minute. So when you're introduced to one of these kinds of quantities, um, inevitably you're going to be given a table. There were a bunch of constants in that equation. And so here's the table that you will be using on exams. This is from the textbook. Um, it's in the equation book that should be provided with on all exams. And you see there's the diffusing species in this column, the host metal, D0, which is the pre-exponential you need for that diffusivity calculation. And then activation energy is given to you in two different unit systems. Um, in general, you're going to need to make this activation energy match the value of the ideal gas constant you use. If you go back and look at the equation, R is going to have units. And QD is in this exponential term, so it needs to have the right units. And the preferred units will be joules per mole degree Kelvin. So you're going to usually use this column that's kilojoules per mole. Now, when you see something like this, you say, OK, great. I know I can calculate diffusivities. Um, if you've never done a diffusivity calculation, that should make you a little nervous. And so often they'll do something really nice like this and give you some calculated values. And this is very helpful because this is essentially 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 practice problems that you can do. Here's a temperature. Here's a given diffusivity. You should be able to take this temperature, this activation energy, this D0, and the ideal gas constant, which is 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin, and you should be able to get 3.0 times 10 to the minus 21, and so on. And so you have no excuse for ever missing a diffusion calculation because the book has 14 practice problems for you in it. The other thing that this is good for is when you're calculating something in the range that's not one of these values, let's say 1,000 degrees, your answer better fall between these two. The common mistake students make are they forget about the kilojoules which is a 10 to the 3 factor. When you do an exponential with a 10 to the 3 error, you do not get anything close to this answer. So you have no excuse for missing calculations since you can practice a million times here and you have a way to check that you did things properly, probably correctly um, by comparing them to good values. All right. So what about real diffusion problems? Um, we're going to use diffusivity in uh, a lot of cases where we have um, known, known concentrations. And, but we're not going to use in that equation any kind of variation in the D0 based on those concentrations, where you have this, the one value of D0 and the one value of QD. But if we look at some real experimental data, we find that diffusivity actually varies with the concentration of the diffusing species. So these are all diffusing in gold, nickel diffusing in gold, palladium and platinum diffusing in gold. And what you find is that OK, as I add platinum, not much change until we get to about 60% platinum. And then we begin to see a change in diffusivity. With nickel, it's much more rapid. There's a change almost from the beginning. And as nickel is added to the gold, it begins to seriously affect the ease of diffusion of nickel in the uh, parent material or host material. However, most of the problems we're going to do be doing are very small concentrations, less than 10%. And in that range, essentially, the diffusivity doesn't change. So the use of the diffusivity equation is fine for low concentration problems. You need to remember in the real world, if you're dealing with diffusion bonding, for example, where you're talking 50-50, the diffusivity calculation is probably not valid um, if you use that equation. All right. So that leads us then to applications. Now, there are two kinds of diffusion problems. The first of these is we call a first law problem, because we're real creative a fixed first law, and it's a steady state diffusion. Now, you haven't had calculus yet, and we don't require it. And so steady state means nothing is changing with respect to time. Things can be changing with respect to space, 
They can vary over space, but they cannot change as time goes forward. And so the solution, or the, the, uh, the basic difference equation, is that the flux, or the flow, of the diffusing species is proportional to the change in concentration divided by the distance between the points over which we have that concentration change. And we'll look at what that looks like graphically in just a second. And then the constant of proportionality is the diffusivity, which is temperature dependent. So you calculate this using your diffusivity equation. Now, um, you'll see this either as delta, where we're talking about discrete values, or this could be differential um, if you want to do partial differential equations. Since you haven't had that, we won't do that. The way this works out, or the kinds of problems we're talking about for this, is that you have a wall or a barrier. And that wall or barrier um, has one concentration on one side and a different concentration on the other side. So in this case, it's a gas at pressure PA, a gas at pressure PB on this side. And so what happens is gas on this side diffuses through the wall, comes out here, and obviously that would change this concentration. And so if China concentration is changing with time, this is a steady state. So what we must be doing is supplying gas on this side to keep replenishing that that diffuses and taking away the gas on this side to maintain a constant pressure. The most common takeaway is you're diffusing to atmosphere, and I don't care how hard you try, you probably cannot change the concentration of anything in the atmosphere over the scale of any engineering problem anyway. So atmosphere is an infinite sink, and on this side we'll usually be pumping in a compressor or a pipeline, um, or you'll have a, a gas, a headspace, and a storage tank um, where most of the gas is in a liquid and it has to, to bubble out before it can diffuse. Anyway, in any of those cases, the key will be constant pressure internally or constant concentration internally, constant concentration outside. And so what our first law, the problem is describing is that if we plotted versus XA, which is the position at the wall on the inside, and XB, which would be the position on the wall on the outside, that's our distance between two points of known concentration. This is the concentration at the inner wall surface, concentration at the outer wall surface. Between them, we have a constant gradient, um, a constantly varying uh, concentration of, uh, of the species, the diffusing species. So all we've done is describe, if you go back to the equation, this is dc dx. If we plot concentration versus x, dc dx is a slope, correct? Change in y over change in x. So we're looking at the slope of the gradient between those two points. So you simply need to know the concentration at two points in a situation where you have diffusion. You can get this concentration gradient, and from it, from it you're going to calculate a flux. Okay, where do we care about? Why do we care about this? Well, we're going to look at some problems where we have stuff leaking through walls, but here's an application that if you're really big on um, renewable energy or alternative power sources, um, a, a good way to burn hydrogen is in a um, fuel cell. And in a fuel cell, you're going to combine the hydrogen with oxygen to make water, and the electron transfer that happens happens through the devices you want to power. And so you're making electricity by a chemical reaction. It's pretty cool. The problem with fuel cells, one of the problems with them, besides uh, problems with the electrodes, is that you have to have very pure hydrogen usually. It's very difficult to purify hydrogen um, affordably. It's usually separated cryogenically, which is terribly expensive because you have to use high temperatures, I mean high, high pressures and low temperatures to separate out the uh, liquid hydrogen, and it liquefies at a very low temperature. So the goal has been to find an easy way to separate or purify hydrogen. What they do is you usually have a membrane very thin of uh, a metal, or titanium or some other compatible metal. And what happens is you can feed in a mixed stream of gas here, and there's N2, and there's carbon monoxide, and there's carbon dioxide. There could even be water. Um, and this is fed through. This membrane is very thin. The hydrogen H2s disassociate. Individual hydrogen atoms diffuse through. They recombine on the side, and you get H2 gas that's absolutely pure because CO and O and O2 and N2 can't diffuse through this membrane. Anyway, so it's a neat application. We keep pumping stuff in here, constant concentration. We keep taking this away, constant concentration. This is a first law problem. All right, so let's do a first law problem. What did I do here? 
Okay, one of the challenges that you'll face is identifying whether a problem is a first law problem or not. And so let's just look at a few cases. And the key is, is this a steady state problem? If it is, it's first law. If it's not, it's second law. So the one we just did is obviously pipeline carrying hydrogen gas. That's obviously a first law. We just did a first law calculation. But let's say you go to the dentist and they make you put that goop in your mouth and hold it or gargle or whatever they do. And your teeth absorbs fluoride, which it doesn't have when you start during treatment. Now, if you think about it, your tooth started out with no fluoride. Now it has fluoride, so that is obviously a second law problem because concentration has changed with time. We put a part in the furnace, as you're doing in the lab, and we're heating it, and that furnace has oxygen. So carbon in the part reacts with the oxygen, and you lose carbon in the steel. Is that a first law problem or second law problem? Well, started out with carbon. We're losing carbon. Concentration is changing in time. And so decarburization, as we call it, is actually a second law phenomenon. Yeah, helium escapes through the walls of a rubber balloon, and this can be a little tricky. If you think about it, as the helium leaves, obviously you're losing helium. However, the internal pressure for a time will remain constant because the balloon will shrink. And so the concentration internally will be the same. The area is now changing, but that's not a second law problem in a classical sense until you get to a point where um, the helium concentration starts to drop. All right, so those are, there is the second law, obviously, if the processes are not um, constant or a steady state, we have changes in time. And so fixed second law, we're not actually giving you the differential equation. First law, we gave you the differential equation. This is not, this is the solution to the differential equation. It's a mess, it's a second order mixed variable. It's a differential equation in both time and space. And so it's kind of a pain to to do this since none of you had Diffie-Q yet. But this is the solution to the differential equation. And it's in a form of a classical solution, which is the variables of interest, position, time, and then a constitutive property, the diffusivity that is the law that or the, the property that governs how stuff diffuses, those are in one side of the solution. And the other side of this solution consists entirely of what are called boundary or initial conditions. These are known values for a given or a particular problem of values, uh, concentration at some point x, which is in the equation on the right-hand side, the initial concentration, C0, and in a surface concentration. These all are going to be constant. These three are going to be constant over the course of the problem. Cx is going to vary with x and with time. And so this is a classic functional solution to a fairly complicated differential equation. And we have this weird thing introduced here, ERF. And since you haven't had Diffie-Q yet, you don't know, that is called the error function. And it's a complex um, integral function that you're not going to be able to evaluate. So physically thinking about a problem, we have a part, let's say hydrogen is diffusing in. That's usually bad when hydrogen is diffusing into your metal parts um, because hydrogen tends to make them become very brittle. So x is the depth into the part. X, Cx would be the concentration at distance x. Cs would be the concentration at the surface. It's in the material, but it's right on the surface concentration. And C0 would be how much hydrogen did I have at point x in, or anywhere in the part at time 0. So C0 is an initial condition. Cs is a boundary condition, what's happening on the boundary. And C0, uh, Cx is my variable uh, for concentration in the problem. So you're going to set problems up. You need to know the surface, Cs. You need to know the initial, C0. And you're going to need to know um, the target, or you're going to be calculating the target for a given time. Now, we talk about the error function. Um, let's just look at it for a moment. You're not going to be able to punch this on your calculator, even if you're, you're not going to be allowed to use a fancy calculator in the tests, and the non-fancy calculators do not have the ERF built in. So you're going to have to use this table. It'll be in the equation book. As you look at it, here's your value of z, the argument, and here's the function uh, evaluated at z. Notice what happens. z starts out at 0, 0 for the earth. As we go up, initially they're kind of tracking, but the earth is rising faster a little bit. But at some point, 
there's a crossover here, and the z value gets larger than the earth value. And the earth value asymptotically approaches 1. You get the point to four nines here at a z value of 2.8. So it's a very, um, has a very small range uh, of values um, before it, you know, it saturates essentially at 1. Um, and you're going to need to be able to work this table both ways. That is, sometimes you'll have the z value, and you'll just look up the ERF. But more often than not, you're going to have the ERF value, and you're going to need to go back to the z. And so you're going to need to be comfortable going either way um, on this table. All right. Now, we need to maybe take a moment and go watch the uh, solved second law problem so you fully understand this equation, and then come back. If you've just come back, we're looking at the second law problem, or the second law equation. We want to ask, what happens if I have an existing process? I have a raw material that has a known concentration. I have a furnace or an environment that gives me a known surface concentration. And we have some target value that we want to produce. We're going to change the concentration at some depth in the material. And so we've been running our process nicely, the desired depth, x and we know it takes two hours or whatever at a given temperature, which determines the diffusivity. So we have an existing process. What you may want to do is somebody in your management may come say, hey, we need to cut 20 minutes off that cycle time. So we need to shorten the time here. Now the question is, if I'm making the same product from the same raw material, nothing over here changes. If nothing over here changes, then nothing outside the earth function changes. So do I have to use the earth function at all? And, of course, you don't. So your old process has a value for everything outside the equation. Your new process has exactly the same value, using the same raw material, using the same surface concentration. All you're going to do is play with temperature, which changes diffusivity, to shorten the time. And so you're just playing with stuff inside the earth. So what you can do is set this from the old process equal to this quantity for the new process, which means you can set these two arguments equal to each other, and the result is this very nice, simple equation that you can, if you don't play with the raw material, you don't play with the, the surface concentration, you don't play with the target value uh, of concentration, then you can adjust the depth for that concentration, time, and temperature interchangeably by a simple algebraic operation. And so you, as we're finishing here, um, you need to go and watch an example problem being done with this. And that concludes our introduction to diffusion.